Nadim Zahawi, welcome to GB News. A year since we have lost Her Majesty the Queen. What are your fondest memories of meeting Her Late Majesty? I have to say, um, I think personally, my um, memory forever will be when she made me Chancellor of the Exchequer. So I was her last Chancellor of the Exchequer. I um, had the privilege of uh, being made Chancellor of the Exchequer at Windsor. And um, uh, she was remarkable, as she always is. Um, she uh, will always um, have a profound question and a comment um, that uh, she shares with her ministers. Uh, and for me, it was, you've got your work cut out, Charles. <laughs> well, she seems to know her brief then, doesn't she? Incredibly well, incredibly well. Really aware of the minutiae of the details of the local elections, uh, which uh, was for someone who was an ex-pollster, it was truly remarkable and impressive. Can you remember the last time you met her in person? Yes, absolutely. That was at Windsor Castle um, uh, when Boris made me Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, of course, um, uh, you are then received by Her Majesty uh, uh, to be uh, sworn in made Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, and um, she was in really you know, a happy place, is the way I would describe uh, how I, you know, my sense of her mood and uh, her health. Uh, and that was the last time. I see. So Liz Truss won the Conservative leadership election. And then there was rumblings that perhaps Her Majesty would stay at Balmoral and the Prime Minister-to-be would travel up rather than traditionally what happens at Buckingham Palace. Um, was the government involved in those conversations? And was there a situation where people genuinely thought the Queen was quite ill at that point? I was made Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, um, but my appointment sort of came quite late in the afternoon, obviously after um, Liz Truss had uh, come back from Balmoral. Um, other than my chief of staff, who um, had, uh, whether it's a sixth sense or an, uh, a, 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 a sort of fantastic um, ability to look around corners, he said, boss, you know, the moment we're in the department, one of the first briefings you need to have is on Operation London Bridge. Um, I was slightly taken aback because I thought, you know, um, I'd met the Queen only recently when I was obviously made uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, but uh, actually, that advice from my Chief of Staff, James Price, was invaluable uh, because the moment I uh, got into the Cabinet Office um, that evening, I had a briefing on Operation London Bridge. Um, and I had uh, then um, decided, because it was my first day in the job, I'd have a more detailed briefing in the morning. But then we had no um, uh, real um, news of her health, um, other than she was um, you know, recovering well. So just to be clear, this, this morning, the morning you're talking about is the 7th of September, the day before Her Majesty passed away. Correct. Correct. Absolutely okay. right. So when you saw the photograph, which turned out to be the last photograph of Her Majesty with meeting Liz Truss at Balmoral, what was your first instinct? Did she look similar to when you met her at Windsor, for example, or had she deteriorated? No, quite the opposite. You're absolutely right. Um, she, she was um, radiant at Windsor. I thought she, she looked... Um, uh, rather unwell, especially the marks on her hand. Um, it was only really that afternoon uh, or early evening of the 7th uh, did we begin to realise that actually maybe there's something wrong. And I tell you what happened. We were, as a new cabinet, instructed that we will all be sworn in via video link at 5 p.m., in the Cobra room, um, in the cabinet office. And of course, we were all uh, present uh, to be sworn in by Her Majesty. And just before uh, that time, we were told she won't be on video. It'll be only on the spider phone. And then 
Um, What's the spider phone? So, so which, which is instead of being um, on screen, we would only hear her voice on on a on one of those. Um, uh, they refer to a spider sure. phone, but the intercom phone yes. sort of thing. Yeah, and then literally a few minutes later, um, we were told that the swear swearing in was cancelled and was to be postponed till the next day. And that's when we all felt that um, clearly um, her health wasn't, um, you know, up to it for her to to, to um, take on such a, such a task. And were you told why it was cancelled? Was there any no. information coming from Balmoral at that point? No, other than um, I, as in my role as as Chancellor of Duchy of Lancaster, um, uh, then had uh, a, a meeting with the. London Bridge team, led by the brilliant uh, Sarah Healy, who was the uh, perm sec at uh, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, who had the lead role as the senior responsible officer for uh, Operation London Bridge. Uh, she came to see me that evening to say, um, you know, the Queen's health is being monitored very closely. Um, we'll have more information in the morning. Um, and you remember the, the statement from the palace that, that evening was that she was being uh, well looked after by her doctors. Yes. That's when I thought, you know, we needed to go much deeper into Operation London Bridge just in case. So it was reactive rather than, Absolutely. you know, kind of any instincts. So on the morning of the 8th of September, when were you first told that the Queen was gravely ill? So I came into... Uh, my department, the cabinet office, and uh, Sarah Healy uh, wanted to see me um, uh, uh, urgently. Uh, she came to see me whilst the prime minister was actually in the chamber uh, in the House of Commons, mm -hmm. um, listening or giving the energy statement, and then obviously listening to Keir Starmer's response to and, that And what time statement. was this? Um, I think it was early morning at about 10, 10, 20, 10, 30 in the morning um, of that day. I then uh, was told that uh, the Queen's health had deteriorated um, and the palace will be putting out a second statement at 11.15, which would have meant that both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition will be in the chamber and so wouldn't have had the ability to respond to the statement from the palace. I rushed to the Prime Minister's office in Parliament behind the Speaker's chair, um, where the uh, Cabinet Secretary, um, uh, Simon Case, was already there um, with uh, her team, the Prime Minister's team, to effectively begin to agree with the palace, a form of words for the prime minister, um, if the statement was to go out whilst the prime minister was still in the chamber. And that's what I took into the chamber. Um, I took in a handwritten note that Simon had written down after a telephone conversation with the palace. Um, and we then also alerted because Keir Starmer was on his feet, if you remember. Yes. Angela Rayner, I asked Angela to come to the um, uh, behind the speaker's chair uh, uh, to take a note to uh, Sir Keir Starmer uh, to brief him on what uh, the palace would be saying, uh, and did the same for the SNP um, uh, as well. Uh, it wasn't then necessary to deliver that statement because the palace delayed their statement. And we all agreed then it would be left up to uh, the Speaker of Parliament, Lindsay Hall, to deliver the few sentences that you need to deliver. And at that point, you say you were told around 10, that was when you were first aware that the Queen had, it, it was a number of hours rather than days and weeks. We were only told that it could be hours, it could be a few days, but she, uh, her health had, had uh, deteriorated sure. um, overnight. And was the Prime Minister aware before she went into the chamber that Her Majesty was gravely ill, as has been reported. Yes, um, before she went to the chamber, she was told that the uh, uh, Her Majesty the Queen health had deteriorated, um, but we were waiting uh, for further news from the palace, as we were told that it may have, it may come 
uh, at 11.15, I thought the most responsible thing to do was to make sure that both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the SNP um, and the Liberal Democrats were, were, were briefed just in case, obviously, with social media, the moment the statement goes out, the whole chamber would be aware and they would have uh, had to obviously respond immediately to it. Yes, and we had, there's camera shots of you and the Prime Minister in, in quite serious discussion on the, on the front bench. What was the Prime Minister saying to you in response? Did she give you instructions to go out of the chamber afterwards while she was still in there? I basically informed her of um, the uh, uh, imminent statement from the palace. I said it, it could come at 11.15 whilst you're still in chamber. Here is the agreed form of words with the palace um, that the PM would deliver uh, at the dispatch box. Um, and I said, we're in your office making preparations uh, for, for you, um, obviously to then uh, be ready to, to address the nation and also then chair your first COBRA meeting. So the PM chaired the first COBRA meeting that evening um, for Operation London Bridge and then handed over to me for all subsequent meetings. So we met every single day at, at noon um, all the way through till uh, uh, the funeral. I see. Can you remember being told that the Queen had died? Yes, I vividly remember uh, that moment and I was in my office in the cabinet office um, and had to um, sort of close the door um, where myself and my chief of staff had a sort of our own sort of tearful moment um, just the moment we heard the news and um, really ha had to make sure that we were ready to operationalize uh, what is what became the equivalent of organising the Olympic Games uh, at short notice? Um, the greatest gathering of monarchs, prime ministers, world leaders at short notice in history. And it must uh, be difficult knowing that news, and the public doesn't at that point, very presumably. True. Very true. It, it, it was one of those moments. To this day, I get goosebumps as I recall um, at that moment, and knowing that we're going to have to wait, um, you know, a few more. Um, uh, hours before the news then obviously uh, is reported to the nation. Yeah, so you were told a few more hours before the 6.30 mm -hmm. announcements. And then, of course, as you say, your role, very important as Chancellor for Duchy of Lancaster. What were your main priorities in those first few hours and days? It was a, 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 you know, a sad, heartbreaking moment, but also a privilege for a boy born in Baghdad to be responsible for the the uh, burial and the the organization uh, of the funeral of the greatest monarch um, on earth, in my view. Um, and so we immediately um, operationalized London Bridge. I had a great team of civil servants um, led by Sarah Healy, 1300 civil servants, many of them volunteered from their department uh, into Operation London Bridge. Um, and that evening, uh, the PM chaired the first COBRA meeting where um, every department, every Secretary of State, um, the Scottish Government, uh, the London Mayor, the Met Police, obviously the security services, all uh, uh, in attendance uh, and then handed over to me um, to, to chair the daily meeting uh, to make sure that um, everything went to plan. And I think, you know, we're very good. I've, I've had the privilege in many ways of leading the vaccine operation um, uh, and the vaccine deployment and uh, being very much part of the team that led London Bridge um, and Her Majesty's funeral. We are great as a nation uh, at moments of adversity, at moments of challenge, of coming together, setting our differences aside and just delivering. And the world literally looks on in admiration as to how we do these things. Uh, and again, I, I had the privilege you know, post-vaccine to do, uh, uh, to, to, to be part of this operation. And great credit to the Scottish government. Um, we worked incredibly closely together because obviously she passed uh, at Balmoral. Yes. Um, and of course, uh, uh, the London mayoral operation as well. 
um, you know, excellent people did an incredible job. And when did you first speak to the king? Was this in the 1844 room at Buckingham Palace or had you had uh, conversations before that? No, the, the, the first time was um, at Buckingham Palace. Um, uh, of course, um, uh, the uh, palace was absolutely anchoring the whole operation London Bridge. And again, the team at the palace and the leadership from there was exemplary uh, in terms of working together with us um, uh, and, of course, um, with uh, the uh, House authorities as well in the House of Commons. So in a time like that, it's Buckingham Palace very much in charge with the help of governments and, and relevant authorities. It's l literally everybody uh, coming together. The government uh, has an, uh, what is an operation room with 1,300 civil servants. Every department um, has a lead uh, and a Secretary of State in attendance. Um, the royal household, um, the obviously the House authorities uh, in the House of Commons, the Mayor of London, the Scottish Government, across the board, um, they're very clear um, operational plan of how we deliver this. And everybody has to do their part. And for me, yeah. all I had to do was just effectively chair the meeting yeah. and make sure that we covered every aspect of this, you know, whether it's the queue um, and, you know, where we uh, agree that the, 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 the actual you know, queuing would, would end and, or Hyde Park and increasing capacity. We doubled capacity in Hyde Park. Uh, uh, because I knew that the nation would turn out yes. it, uh, uh, for Her Majesty and it would have been a, you know, a crying shame if people couldn't get in in front of those big screens. Um, or, of course, the thousands that queued up uh, from uh, Westminster Abbey all the way uh, to Windsor um, at the end of the funeral. And, of course, deciding who gets tickets to Her Majesty's funeral as well, a few disappointed government ministers and, and, and politicians. There's always... Uh, you know, those who will want to pay their respects. Many, many uh, uh, colleagues did that personally, privately. Um, uh, and of course, you saw the, the, the 250,000 plus people who queued up for up to 14 hours um, to, to be able to pay their own respects. Um, and I have to say, um, I think you know, credit to the whole team that, you know, under very difficult circumstances, at short notice, to deliver an event of that magnitude was uh, you know, truly remarkable. What did you say to the king when you saw him in, in Buckingham Palace? The first thing I obviously said is uh, my condolences and you know, explained what we were doing um, uh, in terms of um, the operation uh, and um, really reassured him that, that you know, we were absolutely focused on making sure that every single day um, we meet our targets uh, and that um, the send-off that we give uh, Her Majesty will, will be one that she would be proud of. And did he seem grateful? Like It's incredibly, a huge responsibility, incredibly, right? Incredibly grateful and, and human in the way he, I've always uh, you know, experienced him to be um, uh, in our uh, meetings. I met him uh, for... Uh, he was very interested in education when I was Secretary of State for Education. Uh, we had over an hour together uh, on education um, and on apprenticeships. Uh, and again, um, you know, he, he knew that um, he had a responsibility and I think um, he met that brilliantly. I remember uh, we have a data room in the Cabinet Office where we get all the data in, and if you sort of believed the social media and Twitter, I always I'm very fond of reminding my colleagues that Twitter is not the real world. Yes. Um, I suspect GB News is closer to where the real world is at. Um, but if you believe Twitter, you think, you know, half the nation was a Republican. Um, his first address to the nation had 98% approval rating. It is remarkable. The real nation is those people who queued up for 14 hours, those people who lined the pavements and the streets all the way to Windsor uh, from London. Um, uh, and I think, um, you know, it, his Majesty the King was, you know, it, remarkable during that period and has actually been a, a fantastic monarch. And in this first year, as you say, he's had a lot of responsibility, a lot of change for him. 
how do you think he has done overall in his first year on the job? I think he has been um, impressive, um, brilliant, uh, and as always, human uh, is the way I, I uh, would describe him to anyone who, who if people ask me the question, you know, what was Her Majesty like? What's His Majesty like? And he's incredibly human, um, is the best way. Um, attentive, interested, um, focused. Uh, and I think the nation has appreciated that. You see similarities between His Majesty oh, and Her much Majesty. Oh, so. very much I mean, if you're actually just reflecting on this year, uh, the stability he's brought um, you know, in a pretty tumultuous year uh, for the nation um, in many ways. Um, it, it is not only credit to his abilities, but also very much speaks to the man and his his uh, personality. Do you think he'll visit Stratford upon Avon soon? Are you hoping to? He get, does. Invite he does. Him? He does regularly. He's a, he's a, obviously a great um, a Shakespeare lover. I would actually go further and say he's probably a Shakespearean scholar. Um, and he and uh, Her Majesty the Queen are are you know big supporters of the Royal Shakespeare Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company and, and, and come quite regularly. And sometimes they come in private. Oh, do they? I suppose. And have they been re in the last five years? Yes, they have. They have. Yes. Interesting. And finally, I suppose a year on since her death, I have to ask you, what do you think Queen Elizabeth II's legacy will be? I think in many ways, um, the incredible stability um, ability to deal with challenge and adversity for her nation, to bring the country together as she did during the pandemic. Um, I think if you ask people, they will recall those moments, that address to the nation, when the nation was hurting, when the nation was locked in. Um, she gave us hope. Um, and I think that's what she'll be remembered for to eternity, Elizabeth the Great. Nadine Zahawi, thank you very much. Thank you.